Welcome, everyone, to another brand new episode of the Preventive Medicine Podcast. I hope you all had a wonderful holidays. We still have New Year's ahead of us, but we have a brand new and excellent episode coming your way. And this is actually an episode with a person that I have met with and discussed a lot of these different concepts that I talk about in this podcast with in real life. He actually owns a medical practice in Chicago in the River North area. And that's a lot of what we're going to discuss on today. But he is a serial entrepreneur within the healthcare space. Um, He is Dr. Ari Levy. And he is someone who I draw a lot of inspiration from myself for kind of things I want to do in the future. So there's going to be a lot of good stuff in this episode. But as far as a brief introduction, um, Dr. Levy completed his medical school at the University of Illinois in Chicago before doing his residency in internal medicine at uh, the University of Chicago, where he also completed his MBA at the Chicago um, Booth School of Business. Once again, like I said, he is a serial entrepreneur kind of since that time. He's also done a lot within medicine, being the team physician for the Chicago Blackhawks, which is our NHL or hockey team. And he also helped them hoist the uh, Stanley Cup, obviously not on the actual ice himself, but as a team physician, um, he was with them three times as they kind of won the entire NHL kind of championship. Um, He's also currently an associate professor of medicine at Rush. And most importantly, and what we'll talk about here on this podcast, is that he's a CEO and founder of Shift Medicine, which is that practice within the Chicagoland area that I was kind of talking about a little bit uh, earlier. Um, And it is kind of a consortium of everything we talk about within lifestyle medicine. So it has kind of physical therapy, nutrition, all that kind of stuff, personal training within one roof. So there's a lot to talk about here. Um, Dr. Levy has also appeared and contributes to many different media things as, as uh, far as Forbes, Men's Health, Chicago Magazine. It's been a podcast guest many times, so I am incredibly excited to get into it, and let's do it. Overcoming saber-toothed tigers and woolly mammoths, we must now face a new enemy, ourselves. With the rates of diseases such as heart disease, stroke, diabetes, depression, and many others ballooning, we must find a better solution to these modern epidemics. Welcome to the Preventive Medicine Podcast. We believe in building a foundation of health by means of prevention so that you can build the life you want and find fulfillment with no barriers. Hear from experts around the country on how to take your health into your hands. Take control and build a foundation of health for the life that you want to live. And now, here's your host, Raghav Sharma. We hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, please don't hesitate to subscribe and like for all of our future content. All right, welcome everyone to this brand new episode. And like I was talking about in the intro, um, this is a guest and uh, Dr. Levy is actually a personal inspiration of mine. As he knows, um, there's a lot that I want to draw from him for my future. So this is going to be an interesting episode. So the first thing is welcome to the show, Dr. Levy. Uh, Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. So the first question being the Preventive Medicine Podcast um, is what does preventive medicine mean to you? Uh. Great question. Uh, so for me, it means uh, first understanding, understanding uh, how you how the mind and body works. Then it means understanding your systems, um, how your mind and body works, uh, and where uh, the strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and then building the support that you need to make sure that you can deal with um, three key variables: uh, pain, uncertainty, and the work we have to do in one's mm-hmm. life. That's a great answer. I want to ask a follow-up question on that because you worked with the uh, Program for Personalized Health and Prevention um, kind of with the University of Chicago. Um, And it looks like you worked on kind of personalized kind of prevention kind of plans as far as that goes. What did that entail? And what are you actually doing when you kind of apply that philosophy and that whatever whatever you're saying to patients? Yeah. um, So uh, when we did that at UFC, what it was then uh, was taking uh, an executive physical program um, and help bringing it uh, to current and present and applying the data and the research of what's out there and what isn't out there and and how to help somebody achieve an optimal state. Um, you know, what that really means, uh, I think, is a couple fold. One, it means to listen. Uh, it means to slow down and to ask good questions. Uh, you know, as doctors, we are investigators. Our job is to figure out who you are and where you're at. Um, and what we try and do is understand the content of what's happening uh, within this body and this mind and the context of what's happening around you. And once we can do that, then it makes it a whole heck of a lot easier to help you optimize and improve and make things very specific. So whether we need to do advanced analytics from a data standpoint 
um, or we have to just work on getting uh, certain habits in place. These all come through by getting a very detailed history. Definitely. So it sounds like history is the key. And it sounds like you carry that on to kind of what you're doing right now with Shift. Um, I very, very briefly kind of introduced Shift in the introduction to this. Um, it's kind of like the epitome of lifestyle medicine all under one roof. So can you talk about in your own words, what is Shift? Where did it come from? What inspired you to start this? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, so Shift is a healthcare home. It's an integrated medical practice. And I use the word integrated because what it does is it relies on individuals playing up to their degrees, their skills of what they know and what they don't um, in the domains that we see build health, um, uh, fuel, movement, recovery, and then the medical arena. And so um, Shift is a place where you uh, have a team of people who help assess who you are and where you're at and what you need. Um, and it is a, you know, the initial assessment is six hours. You meet with a dietitian, you meet with a trainer, a physical therapist, you do a DEXA, a VO2, you gather all of your biometrics that you need. Um, you do, um, audiology, uh, spirometry. We, uh, do a gait analysis, all of this stuff. We meet with a doc in the beginning of the day, uh, and you go through all of that testing and meeting with our folks. And then at the end of the day, we go through it and put together uh, a personalized plan for you. Does that make sure. sense? Yeah, that makes sense. How is this different than, let's say, someone will go to their internal medicine physician and they're doing that kind of entire thing on the side? What is the importance or what makes it different that you have kind of the physician and the medical part integrated into it? Well, I think, um, so first of all, um, team. Team has to speak, connect, et cetera. Um, and uh, we as individuals are responsible for doing the work, but it is often quite hard for us to know um what is the right work to do, how to sequence it, you know, and some of the work that you do, how many reps, how many sets, you know, how frequently should I be doing it? How much rest should I be taking? So um, while you may be going to your own provider per se, um, the depth of the assessment um, is much different in terms of what we do than any traditional practice, uh, just in terms of um, access, I think, both to the testing, uh, the resources, and then uh, the return on it, meaning the, the speed by which we um, close the gap on having gathered that information to providing you uh, the next steps. Sure. As a physician, do you actually kind of look at that personal training data and whatever else is going on and kind of take a peek into that and influence it all? Or do you kind of let that up to uh, your team as far as that goes? Well, it depends on... Uh, so. Um, one of the things that I've learned is I have an opinion about everything <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, <laughs> um, not all opinions are warranted or needed. Um, I think what we try and do is play to one another's strengths. I think if there's something that I see or that I sense, I, I will bring that up. And, and we, I encourage that with my teammates as well. Uh, you know, we work together. I think there's a, there's a hierarchy in medicine that exists, uh, sort of a one up, one down, right? The doctor knows all. Um, and it's a difficult one because um, I think that we have to spend time if we want to build team and we want to rely on the strengths of others, uh, we should really be making sure um, that we're leaning on them. And so what we want to do is um, be brutally honest about what we know and what we don't know. And I much prefer, um, you know, as I, as I often tell my team, there's a ton I don't know. And as they experience, there's a ton they know I don't know. Um, but we need to lean on each other to identify that and then ask for help. All right. So the way we got connected was actually funny. So my uh, one of my attending physicians when I was on my ICU rotation, Dr. Osher, uh, she said that I reminded uh, her of yourself because you worked as kind of a coach and personal trainer way back when, um, when you were kind of in medical school and during residency. And that's kind of how you kind of transition to the space and we're interested in it. Um, do you think that this kind of practice of integrating all of it into one house works much better because you have that experience as your background? Do you think any physician who might not have that just does like the traditional medical school, goes to residency, didn't really do anything else? Do you think that practice could work under them? Uh, I think the practice can absolutely work under them. It, it you know, I think what's, what's most important is, uh, you know, as I said before, it's really about uh, making sure you know what you're good at and what you're not and being brutally honest about that and then creating the compliments that are there for you to support it. So it can be, but if you're a silo, if you're siloed as a physician and uh, when you don't see the value in, you know, the other subject matter experts and what they bring to the table, then it's not going to work. 
Um, but, you know, that gets really down to how you build teams. But what we see and what we're seeing, I think, across the board in medicine is, you know, there's a basic principle um, around the reactive traditional care in medicine. We know how to handle those tasks as doctors, as clinicians, as you're experiencing. We get trained on how to handle those super, super quickly. But a lot of health gets built outside of the four walls of a doctor's office. And that's critical, right? Because um, we're not often making our patients healthier in the visits we have with Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Their health is built outside of the four walls of a doctor's office. And if that's the case, then our responsibility lies not in what we tell them to do, but how well we connect and create what we call a tethered relationship so that we're a part of your ecosystem in your daily life. You may reach out to us for a question, right? You may read an article or be talking to a friend, right? And we become relevant and pertinent to and for you. And so that's what we want to be able to do. And so when we talk about other physicians taking this on or bringing this, I'm aspirationally, I'd love to see a lot of people doing this. I think it would be fantastic. Um, you know, what we see with our patients is that when they get a chance to have this, um, they crave it. You know, it's it's one of those things that um, until you have it, you don't know it exists. And once you know it exists, you don't want to let it go. Absolutely. And one of those comes from kind of the business model that you have, which is a little bit different, but we'll put that aside. We're going to get there in a little bit. Um, one of the other things that I've seen recently um, and even more kind of in the past is there's this notion that physicians should get into lifestyle coaching and lifestyle kind of um, just coaching their patients through those things. As you were talking, a lot of health is built outside of the walls of the physician office. As people are realizing that they're saying, oh, in medical school, we should be teaching nutrition. We should be teaching exercise so that we can get these patients that kind of counseling. Do you think that this is is appropriate for the role of a physician. Obviously, you have experience in it. You're comfortable with it. You kind of do it to some extent. But is this something we should be pushing within medical school in the system? Or do we, like you said, leave this for other professionals? Um, I think it's a fascinating question um, that I'm sure if we ask my, me uh, this question three different ways, I'll probably give <laughs> you three slightly different answers. Um, and the reason I say that is because I think it's quite nuanced. And, and what I mean is, um, I think this training needs to exist. And I think it needs to exist because um, uh, matching, right, uh, is very important. So what I mean by matching is uh, marketing and communications knows how to sell messages and themes to people, right, various segments, right, their customer personas. How often are physicians trained on who their customer is? Not to create customer satisfaction, but to create connection, mm -hmm. right? So what are the tools that you have in your toolkit to connect with a human being, to meet them where they're at, so that, right, you can help guide them forward? And I think that that is um, woefully underdeveloped in many of us because classic slash traditional medicine is a problem solution based business. And I, um, I, uh, ign I acknowledge it. I accept it. I embrace it. I think it comes with some wonderful positives and, you know, some glaring weaknesses. Uh, so if we're going to teach and train, we've got to give it, uh, the right attention, right? We don't create a cardiothoracic surgeon, right? In a year. So, it would require a very robust training over time, not just in medical school, but to be carried beyond. Um, where we see this really come to play is uh, actually in the world of psychiatry and psychology and what mm -hmm. we call therapeutic matching. So for anybody that's actually had positive therapeutic interventions with a therapist, a psychiatrist, a psychotherapist, a coach themselves, what we know is one single thing happens. There is a connection, there is a tightness of a bond, and we can unpack that bond in many ways, but there is a tightness there where there's trust, respect, rapport, and a willingness to communicate back and forth. And until that happens, it's going to be very, very hard for us as physicians at large to be able to bring our clinical training and apply that to an individual and get them to make the changes we need them to do as part of their life. Definitely. A brief clarification for our listeners. So we've been talking a lot about how kind of this fitness uh, kind of coaching, all this kind of stuff fits into this medical practice. Um, our listeners might be a little bit confused. Are you also the one who's doing a lot of this? Or are you just focusing on the medicine? Um, so I focus on probably uh, more than most because of 
one, my curiosity and interest. Um, I love the neuroscience of the brain and the body, like how the mind and body are connected, how it works, how our emotions get in our way, how our emotions help us. Um, so while I didn't like that in medical school, I found myself really gravitating towards that afterwards. So um, my first company was a coaching company where we created, uh, we, we built and trained uh, coaches and curricula across the country. And so I'm fascinated by it and love it myself. So um, I still do some of it and we teach and train our physicians around that. So um, we think about you need your residency training, right? Which is your training, your qualifications. You got to get board certified to be able to deliver good internal and family medicine. And then we think about ACLM or, you know, American College of Lifestyle Medicine is giving you the tools and the framework to understand how to talk about what we think are the habitual interventions uh, around lifestyle that help modify and improve. And then we have our own training program that each of our physicians go through where we're listening to their visits, we're coaching them on various topics about how to engage. What are what we call the coachable moments where we can really, you can have an impact for that patient. Absolutely, I think that's very valuable. Um, a lot of physicians, as people have probably experienced, don't have too much time to listen to their patients. I think that's built into the kind of models that exist as in the fee-for-service because the more <laughs> people that you see and the more you're getting billed, all these different kinds of things. So it's not really built in. And we'll talk about your system in a little bit because I think it's really incentivized to be able to connect with those patients because the better you can connect with them, the more value that you can provide those patients. And that's really where that revenue comes from. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. Can you break down some of the different programs that you offer at Shift? I know there's kind of three different categories Categories. What does that look like? And can you take me through a patient's kind of, what does that look like for them? What are they getting yeah. offered? All that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, so there's uh, shift primary care, shift foundations and shift life. And they all have at the foundation, nobody gets different medical care. The medical care across the board is the same and consistent. Everybody gets the same assessment day. Uh, yeah, they're all that information and any advanced testing we need and any referrals and then the ongoing medical care for the rest of the year. So where shift foundations picks up that um, primary care does not is the dietitian and the training staff that you meet that day. Those folks are physical therapists and dietitians help you implement a plan over a 16 week period where we'll test and retest. So we're embedding and scaffolding the right foundational habits for you to put in place for the change to occur. Does that make sense? Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Great. And where shift life picks up that shift foundations and shift primary care left off is that you get all of those. Plus you get access to our facility daily and weekly where we hold small group training. So imagine working out in a visit facility where the team who's assessed you and is caring for you is also there seeing you where you're able to like put it in practice um, and get a workout in. We've that's that's incredible. First off, one of the other things that I want to ask you on this is it's kind of like one of those dreams that we've talked about, I think, with several guests and as well as with other physicians where what if there was a personal training kind of class or personal training studio within your physician's office? What would that look like? And then we think about we think about all these different kinds of things. But then there's always that question of, well, would a patient really take advantage of those kinds of things? Because at the end of the day, it's just another gym, right? And patients, you'll talk to them about going to the gym and they're not going to go. They're not going to take advantage of some of those resources. Do people actually take advantage of this? And what kind of changes have you seen? Um, so, yes, we see folks taking advantage of it. Uh, we've seen it over you know the past six years. Uh, when we talk about changes, I mean, we've seen life transformation. And so we can talk about post-MI uh, and the cardiologists who have sent folks post-cabbage. Uh, we can talk about the weight loss. We can talk about A1C control. We can take all of these. And, and I'm more than happy to talk about a story uh, and share, you know, uh, a specific story. But I think what I find so fascinating is that um, what you're doing is you're trying to create a milieu, right? An environment where somebody feels safe and comfortable to come and go to work and work on themselves and build that up. And um, when I think about uh, many of our problems that we have around habits is that there is a, um, there is a massive amount of information out there, right? And it's information overload. And who are your trusted resources that you use? And if we look at human behavior, right? Our trusted resources 
our our friends, generally speaking. Um, sometimes our you know our uh, impl- you know our our colleagues at work, um, and then we've seen various institutions over the course of you know the last five, 10, 20 years. Um, you know, where they're sort of rocked because the science isn't clear, people don't know what to trust. And so having a clear guiding force is really important uh, for folks. And that's what we want to be able to do. And um, especially for our folks at Shift, um, the consistency is very, very critical, um, establishing that and then building on from there. Definitely. It speaks to the importance of that connection that you're talking about and that you stressed several times on this episode already, because if you have a patient that trusts you and that you've built a connection with, it sounds like they're much more likely to take your advice, first of all. Yeah. Secondly, it creates that safe space where they're able to come in and work on themselves, as you mentioned as well. Yeah. And let me give you a very quick example. You know, So I have um, I think he's a 65-year-old gentleman, a cardiologist sent him our way. Uh, he's already had uh, two stents placed. Um, overweight, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, um, you know, a uh, very classic um, provider, if you will. I'll use the phrase sort of alpha male that's been um, otherwise successful in other domains of his life, but hasn't been able to, to manage this. And um, without going too much into the psychology of it, as he began to work, and weight would come off and changes happen, you know, he had a tight back. He began to feel a little dizzy or lightheaded. All of these things that an individual on his or her own or with a trainer alone may not know what to do with, right? So a tight back, do you stop, right? Is it something that requires PT? Is it something that requires medical intervention, right? How do you figure out what lumbago is? Mm -hmm. Um, And then with the dizziness and lightheadedness, is this a cardiac related issue? Or is it simply as we saw as he was making progress, right? He had to scale back on his antihypertensives. And as he did, right, he was otherwise feeling fine. So it wasn't a recurrence of a cardiac issue. Um, You know, and for a patient to be able to have the feedback loop there that happens in that day, in that moment, and not a week, a month, you know, two months later, allows for what we call, what we see is just greater consistency day in and day out. That is very powerful. And that is the power of kind of what you have created over at Shift. And one of the things that is kind of important to mention about that is that that is kind of one of the things that's built into the business model of concierge medicine. This is where I want to start talking a little bit about that because it is very different than what uh, people outside would think of medicine. They think they go to the physician, they're having this copay, they pay with insurance, they get a bill, all this kind of stuff. They get referrals to various places, they go to their gym, whatever. This is traditional medicine. What is concierge medicine? Yeah, um, uh, it is. <laughs> so um, concierge medicine is basically the buying of a physician's time. It is uh, on is a portion of internal medicine or family medicine where uh, the physician, him or herself, or that practice is basically saying, here is the dollar amount you are going to give us. And in return, here is the care we're going to provide, either a number of visits, amount of communication that we will give for you. So we are negotiating or working directly with uh, the patient. And that may or may not be reimbursable by one's insurance. So concierge medicine is just a, is basically a membership model. And there's varying ranges in terms of uh, price points and uh, amount of service delivery provided. That is a very concise summary. So does this mean that people don't need insurance at all if they are kind of concierge medicine route? Uh, I would not suggest that. Uh, So um, what concierge medicine basically is, is a carve out for that primary care physician's time. Insurance is still going to be required for an ER visit. If you need an MRI, uh, if you have an intervention that's required, uh, it still should be diagnosed coded and billed to the insurance um, and your concierge provider or any other provider should be able to, you know, um, give you what you need there. So would you say that the kind of the main benefit of that concierge medicine is that immediate feedback loop and you don't have to kind of make another visit so that you have to go see this physician instead of something comes up, you can send them a message using (laughs) your portal or text them, whatever it may be. Is that kind of the main benefit here then? Uh, Yeah, you know, I think um, from a patient perspective, you know, I think um, there are a couple of benefits. One, in terms of access to the expert, Um, you know, the other is uh, responsiveness. 
Uh, and then the third one is quality, right? In terms of the quality and depth of the care uh, that that physician provides. Definitely. As far as medicine goes, I want to ask uh, one kind of maybe quote unquote hard hitting question that is concierge medicine sounds expensive. So if you have insurance, you're paying through into insurance. Then on top of that, you have kind of this membership model. You're essentially buying a physician's time and we're not cheap, unfortunately. Um, does this mean that people of lower socioeconomic kind of standing typically can't get access to this kind of uh, model? Uh, so it, yeah, I think it's a wonderful question. I think it's a super, super meaningful question. And I, I, um, I'm glad you asked it. I think a couple of things, one, you know, shift took the position to go into the concierge market space, because typically when you have an innovative medical model or something that's slightly different, um, you, you know, you have to find out who is your payer and is that going to be grant related, right? Are you going to go apply, uh, for a K one or whatever you may be going after to prove it out? Um, or, you know, are you going to have some other funding source? And we took a market position that we wanted to have a membership model to be able to deliver it, uh, to see the value of it, to measure the quality in terms of impact and outcome, uh, for the individuals, as well as quality for the physician to be able to deliver with the hope and intention that we find a way to take on more wallet share. So, um, said another way, there are a lot of membership models out there that are sort of atypical that we don't think of. Uh, so when you think of uh, Oak Street or you think of Iora, um, those are membership models. They're just doing it with the insurer and they're taking on varied risks. So there are varied pay for performance models. Um, and, um, you know, when you talk about average cost of care of a healthy individual or a diabetic for a year, um, when you think about uh, the actual cost of a membership to be able to provide the access, we actually think our price point is very, very, very reasonable compared to you know, uh, the cost of a diabetic or a hypertensive in any given year is somewhere between twelve to $15,000 that, um, you know, somebody who's taking on risk is getting for that member for that year. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that's kind of been borne out in the data significantly is that those of lower socio socioeconomic status typically have much worse outcomes due to of a myriad of things. Um, and number one is always access to kind of healthcare resources or just outreach programs available to them. And it seems that those who are able to access this kind of model, at least on the earlier end, are those that are already going to have maybe quote unquote better outcomes due to other things going on in their lives. So um, not really a question here. It's just kind of one of those statements of those who are socio lower, lower socioeconomic might not have better outcomes and those who are higher already going to get better due to everything else going on. Well, I, I think it's a reality in our world right now. We live in a capitalistic society where this happens, right? Um, people who don't have access um, suffer um, and uh, have worse outcomes uh, from a health perspective. Um, and that is, that is a real pain point. And it is something that I think, you know, when we talk about um, scale and growth and delivering impact, what I would love more than anything is to have a ton of competitors competitors in this space, to have a ton of people who are willing and committed and, and want to take on risk, to take on broader swaths of population and teach and train doctors this way. You know, we're um, itching for fast solutions, right? I mean, that is one of the things we, you know, whether it's the media cycle, the technology cycle, the Twitter cycle, like, right, information uh, you know, spins at a very, very quick pace. And one of the things that we find is is very difficult is holding on to the wisdom that sometimes um, when you're teaching and training people how to interact and engage, it takes time. Um, and so while I would love to scale uh, as fast as I possibly can, uh, there's an upper bound to the number of people, resources, and time in order to make sure that you build a solid foundation uh, that can go about delivering this. I do, I do want to mention that I think that it gets an undue amount of scrutiny that when these models kind of um, put out that they are concierge, just quote unquote more expensive for more wealthy people. If you look at any other industry, however, if you're looking at something that's new and innovative and kind of breaking ground, it's typically to a couple of beta testers first. And those beta testers typically already have increased access. So kind of echoing your point where this is something that needs to be borne out a little bit more, figure out how this works with a smaller market. And then as you're talking about scale and scale and scale, and maybe it can get more affordable, more accessible to a large amount of people. And, you know, um, we can't be, you know, any good entrepreneur knows you also got to ask. 
And so that falls on my shoulders. That falls on other entrepreneurs' shoulders. When we're doing this stuff, there's no reason we can't create scholarship funds uh, and work with academic institutions and study this in underserved populations um, and try. I mean, we've got to deliver on our business uh, and healthcare model first to ensure that that gets delivered well. Uh, but they can't be. There's no reason they can't be parallel paths. Absolutely. Uh, one other question that I have for you as we're kind of coming to the end of this is we like to keep everything uh, evidence based as far as this podcast goes and whatnot. Um, one of the difficulties I see sometimes when it comes to lifestyle medicine, concierge medicine, all that kind of stuff is that when you start looking more towards kind of that consumerism, if patients are kind of just texting you, asking you questions and stuff like that, there's a lot of things that aren't evidence based out there. And a lot of times as providers are just like, meh, as making a kind of easy answer, it's like, okay, we recommend it, whatever. How do you keep things evidence-based when it's such a consumerist kind of model? It's, uh, it's great. I'm great. I'm, I'm grateful that you asked that question. I think that that is um, when I, when I took the risk of building this and taking this outside of the traditional system, that was always my biggest fear was that uh, we were going to be labeled or pushed that way. And what I'm proud of is I'm really proud of our, uh, our team at large and our clinical team in general, because uh, if you think of a bell curve, that is medicine, right? The gold standard in medicine is the mean, right? Now it's the upper end of the mean, but when you talk about one standard deviation to the right and two standard deviations to the right, that's what we call cutting edge and bleeding edge. And so cutting edge and bleeding edge medicine, yes, they often, right? I shouldn't say often. Many pieces from there will make it into gold standard medicine, but there's a very long lag time. So where Shift sees ourselves positioned is we think anchored and framed in gold standard medicine, right at that line where we're sort of, if you, if you take this image, you think about us leaning over to the, to the cutting edge and the bleeding edge and assessing it, asking questions, being ruthless and rigorous about, you know, where is the evidence? Where is it? Where is it not? right? There's a ton of evidence about the value of intermittent fasting and a ton of people promoting its value. I think intermittent fasting is great. You know what intermittent fasting does? It reduces the total amount of <laughs> calories and the window by which you eat it, right? We can talk about all the cellular senescence, the apoptosis, all of these things that come, but there are two very pragmatic and practical things that it does, right? In terms of right? Shortening the window of eating. And oftentimes it's just hard to eat that many calories in that narrow of a window for many folks who are working in the day. So I use that as an example, right? To understand where the science is and where it is not. And where our recommendation is, is we are very, very transparent with people. Like we want to make sure that you have exactly what you need. At the end of the day, some choices are yours. We may not recommend that you do that, but at the end, I don't control you in that and nor am I going to try. But what we want to do is give you the evidence to make the most informed and educated decision for yourself based on your own personal value system. I love that. As physicians, we try to do our best to keep things evidence-based, but uh, sometimes it just gets difficult when you keep getting inundated over and over and over. I think back in the day, I used to write a lot more articles kind of uh, refusing or not not refusing, that's not right. We're like rebutting on certain kind of topics and things that are going out as far as misinformation. And even from a very low level, not having a lot of engagement, like some of these people with like tens of thousands of comments, it gets tiring. Even if you engage and debate with one person, it gets very tiring. So from something that uh, of a business model where patients have much more access, that sounds like something that could get a lot more exhausting over time. So I really commend you for taking that stance. Thank you. Well, you know, here's what I'd say is when you establish rapport in a relationship with somebody, it's not a take take, right? It's a partnership. So what we try and frame up and uh, albeit this is a uh, organizational uh, image, you are the CEO of your life. Our job is to be your senior vice president of health. That number two, we've got to, we've got to set, you have to help us see what your strategic vision is that you're trying to accomplish, right? For, for you and your life. Our job is to assess the strengths and weaknesses, the liabilities, the opportunities, right? Um, to make sure that we can help you get there and be a Sherpa along the way. Absolutely. I, I love that. As our last question in this podcast, we always ask something that's a little bit more on the practical side. So let's say that someone either listens to this podcast and they're like, oh, wow, it's uh, Dr. Ari Levy, or they've seen some other kind of uh, piece of content. You're at Starbucks. They recognize you. They ask you, how do I get healthy? What do you tell them in the two minutes that you're waiting for your drink of choice? <laughs> I probably fumble a lot. You know, two minutes <laughs> is 
Uh, the, I will I will use the two minutes and and make it into twenty. Um, I tell most people don't overthink it. Consistency is key. So building systems is probably the most important thing. When I say systems, I'm thinking about process measures as opposed to the outcome. Don't think about losing weight, right? Think about getting a hit streak of a number of days in a row going to the gym. It doesn't need to be your world's best workout. And it can be just walking, right? Again, it doesn't have to be going to the gym. But I tell people consistency is key. And if you're applying these principles to your sleep, to your movement, to how you fuel your body, how you recover, you're going to you're going to be doing very, very well. Many of us fail in uh, consistency. Well, you did a great job of keeping that in two minutes. I think if you ever do run into that situation, just repeat what you said and you'll be golden. So no need to fumble around. Thank um, you very much. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Um, I'll plug kind of your practice and everything else. Is there anything that you want people to go to specifically and check out? Uh, www.shiftlife.com. Uh, that is our website. We'd love to, uh, see you, hear from you. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions, uh, from today and thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you for your time.